Okay, so my name's Ariana. Um, I'm one of the TAs. And I'm Lexi. I'm the other TA. And we're going to go over Chapter 20, which is Special Populations. Um, so the objectives for this chapter are to understand the value of physical activity for children and create age-appropriate exercise programs, to understand physiological changes with aging and create age-appropriate exercise programs for older adults, describe exercise programming for clients with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or, and hypertension, describe exercise programming for obese clients, and understand how to create exercise programs for individuals with comorbidities. All right, so introduction, special considerations for subpopulations. So who exactly are these special populations? The, they include children, older adults, people with cardiac disease, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and then individuals with comorbidities. Um, so just talking about children, um, they're more active than adults, but only the youngest in, in the group of, that's considered children um, actually fulfill physical activity guidelines. Um, older adults are less active than their younger counterparts um, with 40% reporting that they have no leisure activity. Um, and so things like uh, cardiac disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension are all associated with physical inactivity um, and contribute to 250,000 premature deaths per year. Um, and so PTs, you know, with our field, it's becoming very likely that we're going to interact with these populations um, because people are living longer. Um, older populations are starting to go to the gym more. Um, and we also live in a place where physical act inactivity is commonplace. Um, so program, programming for children. Uh, definition, children and adolescents include individuals from six to 17 years of age. Um, children should participate in at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity per day and include resistance, exercise, and bone loading activity on at least three days. Um, I just want to go over what exactly bone loading activity is. Um, so it's also called osteogenic loading, um, and it's essentially weight-bearing activity. Um, so the stress caused by the weight um, slightly compresses the bone, um, the bone matrix, uh, which triggers the cells to gather together um, calcium and other minerals to increase bone density. Um, examples of activities like this is going to be like running, jumping, and uh, weightlifting can also be considered it. Um, and another thing to focus on with children is these three areas, which are aerobic endurance, muscular strength, and bone strength. Um, also to know uh, medical exams are usually unnecessary for this population um, unless they have another underlying disease. All right, a good old chart. <laughs> um, so what this chart shows is physiological responses to acute exercise in children compared to adults. Um, so kind of what the chart shows us is that children have lower anaerobic capacities. Um, so what this does is it limits their potential to perform high intensity exercise. Um, so you're gonna wanna go more of a moderate route than you would vigorous high intensity. Um, so VO2 is, what, it, what exactly it is, is the difference between oxygen inspired and oxygen expired in a unit of time. Um, and then what, what's different between absolute and, um, sorry, <laughs> absolute and relative oxygen uptake. Um, so absolute is the total amount of oxygen consumed regardless of size, age, or gender. And then relative is, um, it's corrected to a unit of mass or per kilogram, as you can see in the chart. Um, so program for, programming for children, physical activity, um, identify age appropriate activities that are safe and effective and follow the FITVP framework. 
Um, goals for this population are the program should fulfill the minimal amount of physical activity needed um, and activities should be age appropriate and enjoyable. Um, so it's helpful to work with parents um, in order to make a plan to decrease sedentary activity um, and increase activity that promotes physical activity. Um, this is just so, you know, outside of your sessions, they are still maintaining the physical activity that you would be with them during sessions. Um, and this also can help with the gradual progression that's important for this population, especially those who are more sedentary. Um, you wanna give, get about 60 minutes a day. Um, and then just what exactly FitVP is, um, it's five components of exercise prescription, which is, it's an acronym, so it stands for frequency, intensity, time, type, volume, and progression. Uh, other considerations, resistance training. Children should have proper instruction and supervision. Um, thermoregulatory system, so this is their ability to maintain body uh, temperature. Um, so it's underdeveloped and more prone to heat injury. Ma they need to maintain proper hydration, um, consider activity and thermoneutral environment when possible. Um, health concerns for children with health issues or disabilities, call, consult with the child's health care provider. These things would be like asthma, type 1 diabetes, cerebral palsy. Um, also a good thing to note when it comes to resistance training is that any modality used should be fitted to the child's size. So this means you're going to want to use smaller weights, um, kettlebells if you're using them that are smaller fit for children, um, and then machines specifically designed for children. This is going to lessen, um, you know, the likelihood of injury. Um, and when it comes to like health concerns, um, take into account what the healthcare provider says and adapt your program to their conditions, um, symptoms, and their functional capacity. Um, go ahead. All right, so this was just a summary of aerobic resistance and bone loading activity guidelines for children. Um, so the mode is gonna be for aerobic activity, activities that are running, hopping, swimming, dancing, and bicycling. Uh, resistance activity could be unstructured. So it's playing on the playground, climbing trees, tug of war, or it could be structure, which is lifting weights, use of resistance bands. Um, bone loading activity, those would be running, jumping rope, basket, basketball, tennis, and hopscotch. Um, intensity, so you, for aerobic activity, you want to do moderate intensity on those days. Um, for resistance, you're going to use body weight as resistance or 8 to 15 submaximal reps um, to moderate fatigue. Um, all must be performed with good technique. Um, for bone loading, there's no specific recommendation. However, avoid extreme intensity. Um, duration for aerobic should be 60 minutes a day. Um, for resistance, you know, also 60 minutes per day. And then same thing with bone, lo bone loading activity. Um, and they can all be like aerobic resistance and bone loading can all be considered like put in with the same 60 minutes. Um, frequency daily for aerobic resistance, uh, three days a week, and then same for bone loading activity, three days a week. Uh, so now we're getting into older adults. Um, so older adults are individuals 65 years of age or older, um, adults or adults age 50 to 64 years with clinically significant chronic conditions and or functional, functional limitations that impact the ability to be physically active. Physiological function declines with age. However, older adults can still participate in safe and effective exercise programs. Um, chronological, chronological age does not always equal physiologic age. Um, so things like genetic, uh, overall health, disease, injury, and exercise history can alter physiologic age. Um, so this chart is the physiological aspects of aging. 
Um, so max heart rate, max stress volume, and cardiac output all decline with age, um, and they result in reduced exercise capacity um, and decline in VO2 max. Um, just like children, you know, heat tolerance is low due to de decline with age. Um, so hydration is important and means uh, working out in a thermoneutral environment is also important. Um, you know, with this population, even more so than children, it's very important to hydrate um, because at this age, um, they're beginning to have an impaired thirst sensation. Um, so this means they're not going to feel thirsty when their body feels thirsty. Um, so it's very important to maintain hydration. Um, the anaerobic capacity decreases. And what this means is that they have a reduced ability to perform high intensity exercise. Um, also something to note, blood vessels stiffen up um, with age. So it, it leads to an in increase in, rest in resting and exercise systolic blood pressure, um, which in result leads to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease or uh, cardio cardiovascular incident. Um, so successful aging. Exercise can improve quality of life, reduce all cause mortality, assist in activities of daily living and improve independence. Um, so while it can improve quality of life, it also can improve the length of life. Um, there is a strong association with mild to moderate activity and reduction in all-cause mortality. Um, and just a, a definition of activities of daily living, um, like what exactly are they? Um, so they could be cardiovascular endurance activity, muscular strength, endurance, power, flexibility, and balance. Um, all those things in some aspect are needed in order to complete activities of daily living. Um, exercise testing. Exercise programs should consider the following goals, prevent, um, prevent or delay progression of chronic diseases, maintain or enhance functional capacity, prevent functional limitations and disabilities. Um, so you're gonna need a thorough pre-participation health screening and assessment um, due to the high probability of chronic of underlying chronic disease with older populations. Um, and what exactly testing does is that it determines functional capacity and it helps you establish a safe exercise prescription and it gives you a baseline so that you can begin monitoring and um, witnessing, you know, what their progressions are, improvements that they're making um, during the implementation of your exercise program. All right, so this graph shows aerobic exercise program modifications for older adults. Um, so just something to know is that the program should be based on test results, preferences, and capabilities of the adults. Um, and this is to make sure that you know they're coming back to the exercises. If they're doing something that they hate, that they hate, they're more than likely going to stop doing it. Um, and it's also to prevent, you know, overuse injuries, any type of um, exacerbation of any underlying disease they may have. Um, programs should also be individualized for any client that you have, regardless of special population. Um, but, you know, especially for older adults, um, all people are created different and there is no one size fits all program. Um, Oh, just something like definitions that I wanted to go over. Um, CID is coronary artery disease. Um, and a MET is a metabolic equivalent. So it's the amount, one equals the amount of energy while at rest or while sitting. Um, so say you were exerting four METs. Um, that means you're exerting four times the energy that you would at rest. And so this table shows resistance training guidelines for older adults. Um, so resistance training is important to reduce the amount of 
Uh, thank goodness, sorry. Resistance training is important to reduce the amount of muscle mass and protein lost due to aging. Um, so studies say that it also improves cognition, mood, confidence, and self-esteem. Um, just something to note with these populations, explosive activity can still be safe and effective. Um, and for these populations, you know, for mode, you're going to want to be doing eight to 10 exercises using major muscle groups, um, dynamic muscle strengthening, um, intensity should, you know, you should perform each lift or movement with resistance that allows for 10 to 15 repetitions for exercises. Um, all these reps should be done with proper form. Um, if they're not, maybe you should um, decrease the intensity, um, do less reps, um, go to what you can do. Um, for duration, you should complete at least one set of each exercise um, and allow enough rest times between each set um, to lessen fatigue. And frequency uh, resistance training should be performed on two or more non-consecutive days per week. So this graph is balanced exercises and training progress progression for older adults. Um, so sitting for balance, you should sit upright and complete progressions with like the progressions listed below, which are um, leg activities, heel, toe, or single leg raises, marching um, for standing. It's called the clock. Um, you balance on one leg and the other leg at 45 or 90 degree angle. Um, and then you as a PT should call out time. Um, client moves on the non-sport leg to the time called out. Um, and then you alternate legs, um, perform leg activities, spelling, balance on one leg. Um, you should spell words. Um, and working with a non-supported leg. Um, you should do things that are easy for the clients to remember, like their name, day of the week, their favorite food. Um, again, alternate legs, uh, doing things in motion, heel to toe, walking a 15 foot line, um, training progression, arm progressions, um, use surface to support, hands on thigh, hands folded across the chest, um, progressions, chair, balance discs, foam pad, physio ball, um, just overall things to know about balance. Um, reduction in balance can be attributed to a de decrease in joint and muscle flexibility, range of motion, um, muscle strength, and then just central, central, decrease in central processing of sensory info. Um, uh, balance and postural control is very important for activities of daily living. So make sure you incorporate this into your um, program. It can be added into a warm up, the main exercise, cool down, you know, pretty much every aspect of your training program. Um, and then both static and dynamic balance activities should be done at least two times a week. All right, programming for clients with cardiovascular disease. Um, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in, in the US. Nutrition and physical activity are underlying issues related to chronic disease. The goal of the personal trainer is to help clients with primary prevention and atherosclerotic risk factors. Um, so it's said to that 82.6 million adults have cardiovascular disease. Um, what exactly atherosclerotic means is it's a buildup of fat, cholesterol, and other substances in and on the artery walls. Um, and exercise programs, when implemented, can stabilize and re reverse ather atherosclerosis and can be designed for people with um, cardiovascular disease. Programming goals, health benefits exist with, the with total weekly energy expenditure. Utilize the FIT VP principles to meet energy expenditure goals. Um, so your primary goal is to, uh, positive risk factor modification um, for aerobic activities. Um, and meeting goals can, again, positively modify atherosclerosis and reduce the likelihood of cardiac events. 
Um, and what, what exactly your energy expenditure should be is 14 to 23 kcals per kilogram per week. Um, and benefits of meeting that is an increase in cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, it improves risk factors like dyslipidemia, um, body composition, and insulin sensitivity. Um, so this chart is exercise intensity considerations for clients with cardiac disease. Um, program modification, uh, deconditioned and low functioning capacity clients may need to start at low intensities of 20 to 30% HRR or VO2R. Um, target exercise intensity should fall between 10 to 15 beats per minute below a heart rate that has previously elicited abnormal clinical symptoms. So this would be chest pain and, or angina. Um, beta blockers and other heart rate lowering medication will decrease the accuracy of exercise intensity prescription methods based on age prediction maximal heart rate. Um, RPE levels of 11, which is fairly light to 13 somewhat hard typically correspond to the target heart rate for clients with cardiovascular disease first initiating an exercise program. RPE can pay, progress 14 to 16 after several uh, months of training when conditioning has improved and no complications are present. Um, so just definitions again, HRR is heart rate reserve um, and it's the difference between a measured heart rate or predicted max heart rate and a resting heart rate. Um, what VO2R is, is the difference between uh, VO2 at rest and VO2 peak. Um, and just what your energy expenditure should be at, um, it's about 1,000 kcals per week or um, 14 kcals per kilogram per week. Um, and that's to slow atherosclerosis. Um, and this should be done five to seven days per week at a moderate intensity for about 20 to 60 minutes. Um, so this graph is resistance training guidelines for clients with cardiac disease. Um, your program should be based on test results, preferences, capabilities. Oh, am I on the wrong chart? I might be on the wrong chart. Yeah, I'm on the wrong chart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, okay, 20.8, this chart. Um, so you should perform eight to 10 exercises using major muscle groups. Um, dynamic muscle strengthening exercises should include machine and free weights, um, weight-bearing calisthenics, resistance bands, and similar resistance exercises that use major muscle groups. Um, isometric exercise is not recommended for clients with cardiovascular disease. Exercise intensity, um, begin the program with low weight for each exercise, 10 to 15 reps per exercise to moderate fatigue, um, which approximately corresponds to an RPE of 11 to 13. Um, exercise session duration, um, complete one set of each exercise initially, initially multiple sets can be sets can be introduced later as tolerated, um, allow adequate rest between exercises to prevent carryover fatigue, frequency, resistance training should be performed on two to three non-consecutive days per week, progressions, increase slowly as the patient adapts, which is about two to five pounds per week for upper body and five to 10 for lower body. Um, again, more definitions, what exactly is calisthenics? Um, so it, it's gymnastic type exercises. Um, and your goals are to maintain and improve muscular fitness levels for performing activities of daily living, reduce cardiovascular de demands, which means a lower heart rate, lower blood pressure um, that are associated with activities of daily living. So that just means when you're doing um, activities of daily living. Um, request physician approval prior to program in implementation. Um, make sure you know the ins and outs of this condition um, so you are able to prevent um, further injury. Um, and progression, again, should be gradual. Um, and it might be a more realistic goal for these populations just to maintain the strength that they have 
um, than to build, but it all depends on the person. All right, so programming during pregnancy and postpartum. Pregnancy is associated with anatomical and physiological ch changes. Physical activity can provide numerous benefits and safety is top priority. So goals um, for pregnancy and postpartum would be to avoid excessive weight gain, reduce risk of gestational diabetes, um, and <laughs> lower incidence of low back pain and prevent excessive decreases in cardiorespiratory and muscular fitness. Um, just something to note, the likelihood of adverse events or complications following acute or even chronic exercise or training um, to both the mother and the fetus is very low. So it's safe to implement um, training programs during pregnancy and postpartum. Um, pre programming during pregnancy and postpartum. So this is pre-participation screening exercise. Um, refer to the obstetric provider about whether exercise is contraindicated. Complete the PARMED X for pregnancy. Be knowledgeable as well as inform the client regarding warning signs to stop an exercise. So what PARMED X is, is it's a checklist and prescription for healthcare providers to evaluate patients who want to enter a prenatal fitness program and for ongoing monitoring of exercising pregnant patients. All right, so this table shows warning signs uh, to determining exercise during pregnancy. So things like this could be vaginal bleeding, um, it's painful uh, amniotic fluid leakage, dyspnea prior to exertion, dizziness, muscle weakness affecting balance, calf pain or swelling, headache and chest pain. Um, fatigue, nausea and vomiting may limit exercise, especially in the first trimester, but it doesn't necessarily rule it out. Um, what exactly is amniotic fluid? Um, so it's a cushion for the baby in the womb um, and it's very dangerous if that begins to leak. So it's very important once that happens to terminate exercise. Um, dyspnea is difficulty breathing or shortness of breath. Um, and prior to exertion would be before you begin exercising with a client. Um, and also with um, pregnant women, you will also have a diminished thermal regulatory control. So it's important important to maintain hydration, um, you know, wear clothing that allows heat dissipation and avoid hot and humid conditions. All right, so I'm gonna be taking over for the second half here. Um, so programming during pregnancy and postpartum, here's some general exercise considerations. Um, pregnant women need increased nutritional requirements. So you gotta keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and they have decreased thermal regulatory control. So they have a decreased ability to regulate their own body temperature, so that can be dangerous. Okay, and here's aerobic exercise program for pregnant women. Um, you wanna choose exercises that are gonna be safe for them. So like walking and cycling, you wanna stay away from anything that could risk them falling and injuring themselves. Um, so exercise intensity, you shouldn't use um, target heart rate to measure exercise intensity. Instead, you can use things um, like the RPE values or the talk test is always a good one to use. Um, so the pregnant woman, she should be able to hold a conversation with you and talk back to you. And if she can't, then she's exercising at too high of an intensity. You can just read the rest of the chart here. All right, so resistance training and flexibility prescription. So general recommendations apply with some special considerations. You wanna avoid activities in this defined position after the first trimester. So that's laying like flat on their back um, with the torso facing up. Avoid isometric or heavy resistance training that might elicit a pressure response. Avoid an overly aggressive flexibility program due to the potential injury because of in increased level of relaxing. Um, so instead you could do like slow static stretching is a good choice. Programming for clients with diabetes. 
So diabetes mellitus is a metabolic disorder due to abnormal pancreatic insulin production and or diminished peripheral action of insulin. So there's two types, type one and type two. Type two diabetes is usually associated with like inactivity and poor diet. Um, it's usually that happens later in life. So the problem is a result of insulin re release and um, impact on blood glucose. So type one diabetes, that's when is an insulin deficiency, or sorry, type one diabetes is an insulin deficiency. Type two diabetes is insulin is produced, but it's ineffective. Um, and I actually recently read an article that a lot more children are starting to get type two diabetes. Um, so that's really sad. So goals to manage diabetes. You wanna improve insulin sensitivity and blood glucose control, improve cardiorespiratory fitness, improve blood lipid profiles and reduce blood pressure. Here's some more goals. Improve muscular strength and endurance, improve flexibility and joint range of motion, reduce body weight and assist with decreasing the risk of diabetic complications. So here's aerobic training for clients with diabetes. Frequency should be about three to seven days per, per week. Um, consider progressing to about five days per week. Intensity should be 40 to 59% of VO2R or heart rate reserve. Um, if the client's overweight or deconditioned, you obviously wanna start at the lower end. Time should be 20 to 60 minutes, accumulating to 150 minutes per week. Um, type walking or a combination of weight bearing and non-weight bearing activities. So progression, maximizing caloric expenditure. So you really wanna maximize the calories you're burning. Okay, so resistance training for clients with diabetes. General recommendations apply with some special considerations. So unique situations may actually pre prevent resistance training, uh, such as like diseases, neuropathy. So circuit training may be helpful in regulating blood groups blood glucose and preventing the age-related muscle loss. Um, here's just some other considerations for clients with diabetes. You really need to know the warning signs for both um, hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, which we'll discuss those in a minute. Um, you wanna avoid exercise when the hypoglycemic medication is at its peak. Clients should eat one to two hours before exercise and they need to check their blood glucose before exercising. Um, and they should also always uh, exercise with a partner just for safety reasons in case they get dizzy or lightheaded. And they should have some fruit juice or candy available in case their blood glucose gets too low. Um, so here's some of those signs and symptoms. So hyperglycemia, uh, let's see, dry skin, hunger, nausea, vomiting, blurred vision. Um, hypoglycemia is dizziness and headaches, weakness, fatigue shaking, confusion, sweating, um, anxious hunger. So watch out for those signs and symptoms. All right, so obese, programming for obese clients. So you're considered to be obese if you have a BMI greater than 30. So some of the programming goals, you wanna maximize the calories you're burning, maintain or increase lean body mass to maintain resting metabolic rates, improve the metabolic profile, lower mortality risk, promote appetite control, and improve mood states. So aerobic training for obese clients, it should be five or more days per week. Um, intensity should be moderate to vigorous activity if possible, um, but that really depends on, on their current fitness level. Time should be 30 minutes per day. You wanna gradually increase to about 60 minutes per day. Um, type, any type of regular exercise is recommended. Really anything that's gonna get the clients to just be moving their body is gonna be beneficial. So here's some additional recommendations for weight loss. Um, weight loss should be gradual. The clients should only be losing one kilogram per week or less. They don't wanna lose any more than that because that can be dangerous. Um, and then you can read the rest of the chart here. So programming for clients with hypertension. 
So you're considered to have hypertension if you have a systolic blood pressure greater or equal to 140 or a diastolic blood pressure greater or equal to 90. So prehypertension, that's a systolic blood pressure between 120 and 139 or a diastolic between 80 and 89. So some of the programming goals, you really want to lower both the systolic and diastolic blood pressures at rest and during exercise. You want a lower risk of mortality from cardiovascular disease and lower risk of other comorbidities, which um, comorbidities is when you're working with clients that have multiple chronic conditions. And you want to incorporate opportunities for clients to pursue other lifestyle changes. So programming for clients with hypertension, aerobic training. The frequency should be most, if not all days per week, if possible. Um, intensity should be moderate, 40 to 59%. If deconditioned, they may need to start on the lower end once again. And if they're on medications, you should use um, RPEs to estimate the intensity. So that's just the scaling. I think the scale is like 60 to 20. So you can use that. Um, time should be 30 to 60 minutes. Type aerobic endurance activities and progression should be gradual and you need to consider changes in medications or other comorbidities. So client programming for clients with hypertension resistance training, it can be performed as a supplement to aerobic exercise. You wanna keep the intensity at about 60 to 80% of one RM and you really wanna emphasize proper technique here. Some other considerations for clients with hypertension. Safety is a primary concern, um, always. Hypotension after exercise, you need to be careful with that. That's an abnormal drop in blood pressure. Uh, so that can be dangerous. You need to monitor that. Um, and gain skill and knowledge in blood pressure monitoring. Programming for clients with comorbidities. So again, that's when you're working with clients with multiple chronic conditions. Programming goals are to lower overall risk of mortality by identifying the condition with higher mortality risk and prioritizing around that condition. Um, so basically you just wanna pick whatever condition is worse and you basically um, program everything based on that while you're keeping the other comorbidities in the back of your mind. Um, recognize the demands comorbidities might place on clients and provide additional guidance and resources. You also have to have realistic expectations. Okay, so here's some exercise prescriptions for common, common clinical populations. Um, so if you're working um, with clients with comorbidities, this might be a good chart for you to look at. You can see like arthritis frequency is three to five days per week, intensity 40 to 59% for 20 to 30 minutes. So you can review the chart there. Programming for clients with comorbidities, just some other considerations. It requires considerable, considerable preparation in designing a safe and effective programming, and it requires thorough pre-participation screening. Um, so a lot of these types of clients, you will need to get like a medical referral before um, you start exercise with them. Baseline fitness assessments can assist in programming goals and understanding limitations accommodate ever-changing chronic conditions, recognize symptoms that may require a medical referral, and understand own limits and expertise. So make sure you're staying within your own scope of practice. All right, and just some take-home points. So again, special populations, that's like children, older adults, um, clients with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and then comorbidities, and also pregnant women. Um, PTs are ultimately responsible to design safe and effective programs for the above subgroups. So it's really important that you're knowledgeable about all these conditions um, and how to program safely and effectively. Those programs designed should be based on sound ev evidence supported by research. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it for chapter 20.